And a shaman is the holy man in a culture that is still hunting. It isn't settled, it isn't agrarian. There is a very strong and important difference between a shaman and a priest. A priest receives his ordination from his superiors. He receives something from a tradition which is handed down. A shaman doesn't. He receives his enlightenment by going off into the forest by himself to be completely alone. A shaman is a man, in other words, who has undergone solitariness. He's gone away into the forest to find out who he really is, because it's very difficult to find that out while you're with other people. And the reason is that other people are busy all the time telling you who you are, in many, many ways, by the laws they impose on you, by the behavior ruts they set on you, by the things they tell you, by the fact that they always call you by your name, and by the fact that when you live among people, you have to be in a state of ceaseless chatter. But if you want to find out who you are before your father and mother conceived you, who you really are, you almost have to go off by yourself. Go into the forest and stop talking, even stop thinking words, and be absolutely alone. Listen to the great silences. And then, if you're lucky, you recover from the illusion that you're just little me, the so-and-so, and you attain the state of nirvana, which means the blown-out state, the relieved state, the sigh of relief. Nirvana may be translated into English as phew. I've at last discovered that I don't have to survive. I can survive, of course, but I don't really have to. Because you discover, you see, that what you really are doesn't have to survive because it's what there is. The real you is it or that. Tat tvam asi. That art thou, as the Hindus say. So then, in the normal life of India, which is not a hunting culture, but a settled culture, there are priests, but there is something beyond the priest. That is to say, when a man or woman has fulfilled his or her life in the world of society. It's the normal thing to do for a person to quit their status in society and become what's called a forest dweller. That is almost, you see, to go back to the hunting culture. They divide people into two classes, Grihasta, which means householder, and Vanaprastha, which means forest dweller. And the older people all hand over their occupations and positions to their children and enter the stage of Vanaprastha or become a Shramana and go outside the stockade. I'm speaking metaphorically. They sometimes do actually, they sometimes don't. And become a nobody. They give up their name. That is to say, the label which designates who they are in terms of caste or class. They become unclassified people. That's why, strictly speaking, you see, Hinduism and Buddhism are not religions. You can classify the religions. You can say, what's your denomination? Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Quaker, etc., 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 you see. But strictly speaking, a Vanaprastha, a Shramana, has no label. He is an unlabeled bottle. So, in uh, the time when the Buddha lived, 
about 600 BC, the Hindu system had become somewhat uh, decadent. It isn't altogether clear what had happened to it, but it was certain that it did seem in some way to be in need of reform. And so, there, there were many reasons for this. And the Buddha, as a young man, being basically troubled by the great problems that we're all troubled with, the problem of suffering, and the problem of what all this universe is about, he endeavored to follow the methods that were then being used by people who were shramanas or vanaprastas, forest dwellers. And at that time, it's very apparent that the main method that these people were using was an ascetic discipline. Starvation, uh, very arduous meditation practices, uh, probably self-flagellation and things of that kind. And it's said that for seven years he practiced these austerities. But he found out that they didn't lead to liberation. And all the people who were practicing them knew they didn't either. But they felt that that was only because they weren't doing it hard enough. And so he propounded instead the middle way. The way uh, that led to liberation from the rat race that I've drawn here, neither through austerities nor through uh, pleasure seeking. See, these are the two ways, the two paths. The people who say uh, the whole point of life is to enjoy it, to get the most out of it, you see. And the other people who tried that and then they found it was sour grapes or something, you know, or they burned their fingers in the pursuit of pleasure. The girl that was so beautiful eventually fell apart what has turned into a shrew and uh, whatever it was and uh, so they said instead let us torment ourselves a lot of people enjoy this or get something special out of it I was in Mexico this summer and what I went there for was to study Mexican Catholicism where they make a great cult of suffering and I was very puzzled about this and wanted to understand it and everywhere you know they have these ghastly uh, tormented Christs, all drooling with blood, hanging on crosses in very contorted positions. And I realized there are certain people who find that the sitting on the tip of a spike is the realest place in the world. Because when you're on the tip of a spike, you know you're there. There's no doubt about it. And also you know that you're expiating for everything. This, uh, somehow by sitting on the, on the spike, you are paying for your guilt. And so long as you hurt, you're all right. See? So these shramanas were doing something of the same kind. And the Buddha became enlightened, became a Buddha. He woke up at the moment when he gave up that kind of quest, the moment he gave up, as we should say, trying to take the kingdom of heaven by storm. Now, what does this mean? It means that in his time, the way of liberation had become competitive, which meant it was on the wrong track. There are a lot of people who we, we call it the holier-than-thou attitude. But we find it today with some objectionable Westerners who go over to Japan to study Zen Buddhism and then come home and brag about the great disciplines they've undergone and say, I sat with my legs crossed in one position for ten hours as distinct from somebody else who only sat for five. And always there's this tendency, you know, to have a marathon and be in a competition with others or with oneself about these things. <clears throat> but the moment you do that, you're back on the wheel. The best thing you can get by asceticism is to get up to the Deva world. You can't get anywhere else by it. 
you may get down to the Naraka world by asceticism too. Read the story Thais by Anatole France. So he found, you see, that the, the real path, the middle way, the meaning of the middle way is that it's the path that can't be followed. Because to get you onto the middle way, I have to get into a dialogue with you, you see, and you say to me, because after all it's always the student that raises the problem, not the teacher. You say, well now what's the right thing to do? I say back to you, why are you looking for the right thing to do? And then you have to consider your situation, where you are. And you say, well, I'm looking for the right thing to do because I feel that I'm in the wrong situation. I don't have peace of mind. Why do you want peace of mind? Because my mind is disturbed. Then, in other words, you as a disturbed mind are trying to find peace of mind. Your quest for peace of mind is the same thing as having a disturbed mind. Now, if you don't have a disturbed mind, you won't ask for peace of mind. Well, how can I quiet my mind? Why are you asking to quiet your mind? Because it's disturbed. You see where you are? So in this way, by this dialogue, the, the guru, the teacher, brings a person back to center. So then this is the point. All Buddhist teaching is a dialogue. Really and truly, the man who goes out and leaves society and becomes a monk is a little bit too much. Buddhism involves this act as a preliminary gesture. But what it comes to in the end is the position of what's called a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva means somebody who went out of society or we should say gave up the world in some way, took on the, the, the robe, took on the discipline. He found what he was looking for, but his finding it was absolutely simultaneous with his coming back into society. And he's called a bodhisattva, as distinct from a pratyeka buddha, which means a private buddha one who goes out and doesn't come back. And the Bodhisattva is considered as having a superior attainment, superior insight. So the important thing to remember then is Buddhism is a dialogue. And its teaching is a method and not a doctrine. Now, the teaching of Buddhism is summed up in what are called the Four Noble Truths. The truth of suffering, the truth about the origin of suffering, the truth about the ceasing of suffering, and the truth about the way to the ceasing of suffering. Dukkha, D-U-H, K-H-A is the Sanskrit word we translate suffering, discord, frustration, something like that. That's always the problem, you see. And this, because of suffering, is the reason why human beings seek out teachers and saviors. I hurt, and I don't want to hurt. So that's the, the universal problem, see, that everybody brings. So then the teacher replies to this problem so then the by saying, the you suffer because you crave things. Trishna, T-R-I-S-H-N-A, from which we get our word thirst, Trishna, Craving or desire is the cause of suffering. That's the second truth. Now, the Buddhist analyzes this. He says, uh, the world is dukkha. It's full of frustration. 
and it's also characterized by impermanence, anitya, and by non-entityness, anatman. That means that no thing exists independently. Everything is a thing only in relation to everything else. Therefore, there are no separate things, no real selves or souls or egos. And trying to cling to the world, which is necessarily changing, trying to have a separate self and to protect it, all these things are Trishna. They are the cause of Dukkha. So, the teacher, having said this, then the student comes back and says, well, how do I get rid of Trishna? If Trishna, desire, is the cause of suffering, couldn't I get rid of desire so as not to suffer? And the teacher says, well, you try. And this then is the first part of the discipline, to try not to desire, to calm your mind, to practice centering, to practice getting rid of all what they call klesha, K-L-E-S-A, uh, disturbing thoughts, distractions, evil passions, uh, immoderate appetites, and come to upeksha or equanimity of mind. And so the student practices that. And this is a very difficult and arduous discipline. And all the time he sees the teacher watching him with a slightly sour expression on his face. And he knows, of course, or thinks he knows, that the teacher is fully aware of his inmost thoughts. Because, you know, it's the Indian way. They go to meeting with the teacher. And the teacher sits under a tree and smokes a cigarette or a pipe or something.